Afternoon, guys. So I got a this link from a very uh, good friend of the channel <clears throat> who asked me to look at uh, the this article, this little piece. It's related to what we talk about on this channel. A website called buildingboys.net wrote this article, which I'm going to read for you guys. It's called The Link Between Freedom and Video Games. And I think it's an absolutely crucial thing to look at. So I'm going to have this uh, game footage of me playing Dark Souls in the background while I read through this article. But here is what it looks like. I will include a link to this in the description so you can look at it yourself. Okay. So how many of you have complained about the amount of time your boys play video games? I have. And so has nearly every other parent of boys, I know. We complain about the number of hours our boys spend glued to screens, and yet I'm beginning to think that we're a big part of the problem. I'm reading an interesting duo of books back to back right now. Savage Park by Amy Fusselman and the soon to be released How to Raise a Wild Child by Scott D. Sampson. That's Dr. Scott from Dinosaur Train. Both books convincingly make the point that children need space, time, and freedom to explore, to learn, and to discover their own capacities and strengths. Sadly, both books also point out the fact that space, time, and freedom are in short supply for today's youth. Today, more than ever before in the course of human history, kids are confined inside the majority of the day. Their days are carefully scripted. Most kids in developed countries spend time in institutional childcare settings from nearly the time of birth. Play time, nap time, and eating time are determined by the needs of the institution, not the whims of individual kids' stomachs or internal clocks. <clears throat> when kids enter school, often at the age of three or four, the regimentation continues. Preschools and in kindergartens are increasingly me, increasingly academic, with more time devoted to letters and numbers than to free play. Free play is nearly non-existent in most elementary schools. Recess has been cut or eliminated in many, and the schools that have retained recess have enacted such strict rules controlling student activity that those few minutes can hardly be called free play. By the time kids are in middle school, recess is all but eliminated. Kids' after school and weekend hours are filled with pre-scheduled adult-guided activities as well. Dance class, baseball, karate, soccer, Mandarin class, cooking class, 4-H, Boy Scouts, religious classes. And truth be told, most of us run pretty strict households as well. We may not allow balls in the house. Our kids might not be allowed to go to the park alone or climb trees or light fires. In today's risk-averse society, very few parents are allowing their children the opportunity to try anything truly risky. Children are born with an innate need to explore and test boundaries, but we thwart those desires at nearly every turn. Almost from the time they are born, the spoken and unspoken message our kids receive today is sit here, be quiet, don't do anything unless you're told to. The only place most of our kids experience true freedom and autonomy today is in video games. In video games, kids are in control. They can do whatever they want. They're free to take risks. And for the most part, it's a world uninhabited by adults. Yes, it's true that many adults play video games, but most of us are not playing the games that our children are. In the past, Samson writes in How to Raise a Wild Child, most children discovered their own secret and wild places, places they could explore, could go to think, could make their own. These private wild places were places kids could test their own abilities and learn about themselves. In many ways, these places were places kids could go to actually and gradually develop their sense of self. Most kids today don't have access to a wild place. We've restricted their physical freedom to the point that most kids are not allowed more than a few yards away from their home base. Adult supervision is nearly constant and adult rules reign supreme. 
Given that this is reality for most of our kids, is it any wonder that so many of them spend so much time in virtual worlds? Virtual reality has become the only place our kids are safe from our intervention, so long as they ignore our pleas to turn that off, a feat most of them seem to have mastered. Perhaps one of the answers to our kids' screen addiction is to offer them more freedom here in the real world. Perhaps if we allowed our kids to explore and take risks here in the real world, the virtual world wouldn't be nearly as attractive. Of course, that's easier said than done. We're products of our world too. And many of us won't feel comfortable letting an eight-year-old start a fire or use a saw, for instance. Please don't let your fear get in the way of your child's development. Take a breath, think back. Children have been building and maintaining fires and assisting adults with hunting and gathering and homemaking activities for millennia. Children are capable of managing some pretty complex maneuvers and responsibilities with some adult guidance. So instead of saying no, look for ways to say yes. Look for ways to expand your child's boundaries and capabilities. Let him try things that are beyond his current ability level. Say yes to climbing trees and splashing in creeks and biking down the big hill. Say yes to a trek into the woods alone, if at all possible. Allow your child to test his abilities and gradually expand his world. I realize that reality poses some pretty formidable obstacles. A Maryland couple is currently under investigation because they allowed their children to walk to a park unattended. And Chicago teen Demario Bailey died earlier this year after his mother finally granted his request to walk to basketball practice. You know your kids in your neighborhood far better than I do. I trust you to make the decisions that are best for your kids and family, given your situation. But at the same time, instead of simply bemoaning kids' disappearance into the virtual world, I challenge each and every one of you to work toward making the real world a viable opportunity for your children. Let's work to once again make the real world an attractive alternative, where a place where kids can play, explore, test boundaries, and bond. Now, one thing I noticed right off the bat, I agree with everything that's in this article, but it is really interesting that they're using words like kids and children. Really, I think this is more an issue with boys. And the fact that this website, buildingboys.net, shared it, it kind of like is a testament to what I'm saying. So what am I, what is the, the takeaway from this? Well, I think this is a good thing because it's true. What we're finding now with this Gamergate 2 situation is that ever since men have been forming social groups, whether that is hunting lodges or stag clubs or the bowling alley or the pool hall or the pub, or a boys club, or the Boy Scouts, whatever it is. For whatever reason, people feel the need to meddle and break it up. And I think the purpose of this is that when men form community, they start thinking for themselves. They start forming ideas, they start organizing, they start building things with men, and they start realizing that they don't need the state, that they don't need oversight, right? in order to do great things. Men coming together and supporting each other and working with each other and building community together is a massive threat to authoritarian status types like feminists. And so they will do everything in their power to break that up. And that's what we're dealing with now in the gaming industry, in this particular space, because this grew to a massive industry and People with authoritarian leanings like feminists and other kinds of commie groups, they felt the need to get in there and break it up. So what do they do? They enter the space, they start calling it toxic. I already went through the five stages of entryism in another video, please check it out. It's on this channel, I'd appreciate it. I think it's very important to understand how this works because the purpose of it is to break it up. And the reason why is because people thinking for themselves that are enjoying a space together is a massive threat to these authoritarians. And in a related, um, in a related uh, instance, I'm gonna show you this from the watch, uh, this is um, a it is a group called the Watch. Their mission is making gaming safer for all gamers. This is how they operate. This is an example of what I mean for when I say that once they enter a hobby or an area, they start demanding 
consolidation. They start asking for, for some changes and they, and they may appear innocent at first, but they're not, they're never innocent because if a space is popular with people, there's a reason. And so if you were already welcomed into the space, like the way it was, then people wanting to change it, that means that they're not, they're not really your friends, okay? They're there to control, micromanage, and ultimately it will destroy it. So their mission, the toxicity rating is what they're doing. And I know that other people have talked about this and they have declared victory because people have rejected it, um, um, uh, you know, uh, over overwhelmingly. However, they will just go back into the shadows and they'll come up with a new thing and they're going to bring it back. So we have to remain vigilant. You have to remain adamant and you have to, to ridicule. That's the most powerful weapon you have. Make fun of these people for how pathetic they are, please. Okay. So our mission, the toxicity rating was created to inform gamers and parents of what kind of content they can expect to encounter while playing online and call attention to the fact that the gaming community desperately needs change to be an inclusive, safe space for all who play. That's That says it right there. Nobody cares about a safe space. They shouldn't care about that. But what are they really doing? So video games are assigned age and consent ratings by the Entertainment Software Rating Board, ESRB, letting parents and the over 3 billion people that play online games make informed decisions. But these ratings are missing one crucial rating for parents. How toxic is the online gaming community? That's why we launched the Toxicity Rating, a rating providing information about each gaming community and what gamers may experience while playing online games. We surveyed hundreds of gamers that take part in online gaming communities every day. They were asked how often they are exposed to racism, gender discrimination, violence, sexual content, crude humor, and controlled substances while gaming. Individual online games were assigned toxicity ratings based on their responses. These will help inform gamers, parents, and the general public of the things the gamers are exposed to while playing some of the biggest online games. Help reform ESRB game ratings and reduce toxicity by citing the petition. And this was created by Melanin Gamers. Melanin Gamers is a change maker organization dedicated to increasing diversity and inclusion in the video game industry. The organization strives to provide a safe space, both online and in real life, for people of color to come together and feel represented. Melanin Gamers hopes to contribute to lasting change in the video game industry that reflects players from all walks of life. These people are monsters. And, and they have to be, they have to be told they're monsters, they have to be ridiculed, that is the most effective tool because they take themselves so seriously, right? That if you tell them, no, you're a joke, get out of here, you're a weirdo, they're, they're, it'll break their brain because they're so certain that what they're doing is like the right thing. And honestly, like how do you measure toxicity? Who decides what is toxic? Because you already saw crude humor, that, that's like a line for them. Gender discrimination, racism these are things that you can't clearly define and of course they operate on a kind of uh, subjective postmodern view of what these things are what's racism to them well they already said Alyssa mercante has said you can't be racist to white people for example right so this isn't useful I mean, it's only going to serve to destroy. I mean, from what I understand, Grand Theft Auto 6 is going to actually like if the if the uh, if people are too toxic online, it could result in people actually being imprisoned and arrested like that's insane. So um, anyway, I just wanted to share this. I think that uh, there's a reason why Gamergate 2, whatever you want to call it. Um, is as big as it is. And, and frankly, it comes down to the fact that it is a space that is dominated by men and boys, and these people want to micromanage it, and we all have to come together and we have to fight against it. Because these people, they're not gamers. They're here to destroy the hobby. They are here to bring their ideology in here, and one of the reasons for that is because they have politicized their entire life, and they insist that we all live that way. 
And the truth is, in order for us to fight against it, we have to accept the fact that we are also engaging in a kind of political pushback because they're making it political. So we just have to tell them, okay then, so we are the politics of not you, and that's where this is going. So anyway, let me know what you guys think about this in the comments. I look forward to your thoughts. I will share links in the description. And um, yeah, please share the video and subscribe because I'm almost at 500 and I'd love to get there. Thank you so much for coming on and, and joining me for this. And I'll see you in the next one. Long live Vivian.